am so excited to be joined today by Dr. Annika Becker, author of The Hormone Fix. She is a triple board certified OBGYN. She's known as the girlfriend doctor, and she knows exactly how to optimize, optimize your hormones and make you look and feel fantastic. So I'm so thrilled to have you here, Dr. Anna. Welcome to the show. I'm thrilled to be here with you, Angela. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so exciting. So let's start because you have a pretty crazy story, I guess, right? You've been through menopause and back twice and reversed it, which not many people can say. That's hugely impressive. And we were talking about there just before the show about how, you know, postponing menopause as long as you can is actually an indicator that you are aging well and potentially even reversing your biological age. So can you just kind of share the background? How did that happen in terms of what happened going through it and then managing to actually reverse it? Yeah, yeah, no. And then in two accounts. So at 39, um, as I shared with you, and I write about in my book, The Hormone Fix, that uh, we went through a really strong personal tragedy, it, a traumatic event in which we lost our toddler son, who was only 18 months and three days old. And from that instance, and I was still breastfeeding him, Angela, and you know, like, you know, when you're breastfeeding your baby and you miss a feeding, your breasts become really, really engorged. Oh and from that point, like from, from that accident, from that time I had, I didn't have another, my breast didn't produce another drop of milk. Like they dried up instantly and the hormonal changes from there were just, you know, continued to spiral from trauma, from grief, then led into PTSD. And, um, and so that started, and here I was as an OBGYN, you know, and I had conceived three, three babies naturally. And we then were trying, trying everything to have another baby, not to replace our son, but to, you know, we love children and to really, it was a huge void in our lives. And so after that trauma, and then cycle after cycle, after cycle of fail, you know, of you know, um, no pregnancy. And it was like grief and loss again and again and again in our lives. And so, um, you know, with the highest doses of reproductive infertility meds, I, I had no ovarian response. My FSH was through the roof. I, my repro endo colleague, reproductive endocrinology colleague and fertility specialist, he said that my only chance to conceive was egg donation. I was in early menopause and had premature ovarian failure is what we called it. And um, that that was it, no chance. And that was grief upon grief at that time. And that took me on a journey around the world, really like always travel has been a meditation for me. And, and from that experience, I, I learned, you know, since my doctor's bag was empty, right, all my tools were gone, the best of the best mm -hmm. in our, uh, in our specialty was, you know, tried on me and nothing. And so my journey around the world just led me to discover some, you know, healing foods and healing ways of living and, and healing thinking. And, and, um, and that's why, when I came back from my journey, I became, I restored my periods. My periods were naturally restored. And I said, the hand of God was in this every step of the way. I mean, the people I met and the, the leaders in, in their medical fields and from ancient traditions from, you know, a Andean philosopher to an Indonesian healer, all these things I integrated into my life and restored my menstrual cycle. But beyond that, I became pregnant naturally at 41, delivered my beautiful baby girl, Ava Marie. So Amazing. the child I was told I would never be able to have. And, and yeah, it was just that opened up my eyes and I incorporate all these things into my practice. That's where I created my product, Mighty Maca Plus, because of maca and other superfoods that I used as a cocktail to, um, balance my hormones, support my adrenal glands, detox my body, alkalinize my body. And these things I incorporate into my healing regimen as well as lifestyle. And yet, you know, to make a long story short at, um, you know, the continued, the PTSD, the trauma 
of our son's accident and, you know, further spiraled my life down. Like I didn't understand PTSD, but to live through it, I understand it now. And, um, from sleeplessness, sleeping only three hours a night and, you know, chronic anxiety and fear and triggers. And even though I was still working through that, that underlying physiology was still going on. And, um, it led me, you know, to disconnect, disconnect from my marriage. And I write about that in the hormone fix, the oxytocin cortisol disconnect Mm -hmm. and really burn out from my medical practice. And there at age 48, I was spiraling into another menopause and, um, brain fog, you know, and I'd been doing everything right. And, you know, and still like, okay, now my body's changing again, gained 20 pounds, what felt like overnight without doing anything different, had the brain fog, had mood swings and irritability. And I'm like, I cannot raise teenagers this way, let alone Ava Marie was in the beginning preschool. And as a single mom at this time, you know, doing everything on my own, it was really challenging. So I, I dug into the research. I went strict keto and that's where I found like keto for women doesn't work unless you're keto green, as I call it, really Mm. focusing on that alkalinity factor and then lost the extra weight felt, you know, just empowered and clear headed and, and brought myself back out of this, this downward, another downward spiral. And, and from that point, that's where I created my online program, magic menopause to help women through it. And then um, my essentially menopause diet book, which is the hormone fix was the first one that I put out. And to really understand it's not just about what we eat, but it's how we live, how we think and these aspects. So it's been, uh, it's been quite the journey around the world and back (laughs) and, um, yeah, it has been an incredible journey and I, I'm, I'm, I'm sad. I'm so sorry to hear that you had to suffer such tremendous grief and pain to do and to go through all of that, but you have an incredible wealth, um, that you share now with the world. Um, and hopefully his memory lives on in that way and all the work that you do and, and helping so many women, Um, you touched upon so many things there that like, that I know women are going through in different, in different forms. There were just so many things that I I'd like to pick up on. You mentioned obviously the cortisol and the stress, and this is so topical right now. Just so many people that I'm speaking to, I don't think I've ever run as many Dutch tests as I'm doing at the moment. Everybody's so stressed and their hormones are out of whack. And I guess, you know, there's unity in it because we are in a global pandemic, um, But what happens there really, because with women's hormones, they're so disrupted by excess cortisol and stress, but it can be like so painful, can't it? Because it's actually a really tough thing to get under wraps when you're challenged, right? Maybe you have got some emotional trauma that you're going through, you're going through a divorce, maybe you've got financial issues, which many people have at the moment. Um, And I love the way that you talk about the whole kind of holistic path that you've taken, which uh, is quite unusual, isn't it, among medical professionals? Um, where, where can someone get started? Like at the moment, if they're just in that really high stress, um, environment. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you, Angela. I would say, I wish, you know, I wish no one, the journey I've been on to learn what I know, right. What's in my doctor's bag now. And that's why I'm so passionate about writing about this. And I do believe that, you know, my son's spirits, you know, is, is helping, is helping along for sure. And, Mm -hmm. um, the biggest thing like to understand when we're in this stress, either it's post-traumatic stress or chronic everyday stress, like so many of us are experiencing right now, that chronic production of cortisol, which cortisol is the most acidifying hormone in our body. It will rob and steal our nutrients, right? To, to um, do what it needs to do, which is it's potent anti-inflammatory. But the thing is that when cortisol is up, oxytocin is down and oxytocin, not to be confused with oxycodone, because I get that sometimes. So oxytocin is the hormone of love, bonding and connection. It's like the hormone we inject in labor, pitocin, to make contractions start. It's that bonding hormone that we produce in in abundance in pregnancy and in delivery that when we see this child, no one can explain that feeling, right? Just that, that complete adoration of this child, that oxytocin is that bonding hormone and same with sex. Oxytocin is secreted with orgasm and climax. And so it further connects us to our our partner. And that's really powerful. So when cortisol goes up, oxytocin goes down. And when cortisol's up for a long time, the 
paraventricular nucleus in the brain says, okay, you're frying me out, shutting you down, you know, and you're just going to be at this chronic low level, lower level. And oxytocin is down at the same time. And this is what people are feeling. They're feeling disconnected. They're feeling isolated. They're feeling alone and unloved, even though people around them love them. And I, as I experienced it myself, like that disconnect from my marriage, I wanted my marriage to work, you know, but then, you know, it, I didn't feel love mm. for my husband anymore. I didn't feel connected for my husband. I didn't feel love for my love, love profession. I loved, I burnt out, right? That's what comes from this physiologic. It's, there's a physiology to divorce. There's a physiology to burnout. And cortisol is a big player in that physiology. It's the most acidifying hormone. And then oxytocin is the most alkalinizing hormone. So the first thing that anyone who's experiencing this chronic stress, this havoc, because cortisol is going up, it's robbing all your sex hormones from our mother hormone, progesterone in both men and women to our reproductive hormones, estrogen and testosterone, as well as DHEA. So core, everything is sacrificed in order to keep cortisol produced at some level, even a low level. Okay. And so when this is happening, you know, what we have to do, we have to increase oxytocin. So the first thing is like, what gives me pleasure? And I think that is such a powerful thing. What makes me laugh? What brings a smile to my face? What brings me pleasure? And it's often a very hard question to answer when you're in that physiologic state of disconnect, mm -hmm. but it's so important. It's a pet, it's a friend, it's an activity. And it's so honestly better than anything I can write on a prescription pad and we can prescribe oxytocin, but better than anything I can write on a prescription pad, we definitely want to, to incorporate more pleasure, more fun, more joy into our lives. And that will empower oxytocin. So when we raise oxytocin, we're going to help subdue that cortisol, create that balance that's happening. And so raising it, oxytocin is one of the quickest ways to lower cortisol. Yeah. Interesting. Isn't it? Because I felt the disconnect that you talk about there, I 100% felt when I went through my own period of burnout, but it was actually after I had my three kids and I was, I'd been practicing as a lawyer for many years and I was totally burnt out. I'd had my three kids in four years and then I suffered terribly with postnatal depression. And while I adored my children, you know, I was thinking of suicide and I just wanted out until finally I'm admitted to hospital with double pneumonia and suspected lung cancer. And there it is staring me in the face and I then connected with myself. It was actually the high fevers that I believe allowed me to do that, kind of created this lucid state where I was like, I'd gone from that disconnect you talk about is so powerful because I believe that my kids would be better without me, right? That somehow I shouldn't be in their life. They were going to be happier and better without me. And then when I had this experience and I came out and I felt grateful every single day of my life since that day to be alive, I connect with that love. And it's so true what you say, just the, the stress just goes suddenly, like you just become more mindful and more present and in the moment, don't you? You have to leave the back, the past behind, mm. past behind shift onto exactly what that is. And when you are experiencing gratitude, when you become grateful, when you, are, you know, are grateful for the little things in your life that increases oxytocin. Gratitude is one of the, the practices that helps us increase oxytocin. Angela, I just want to cry because you're not alone in that. And two, after the loss of my son, every day I wanted to die. Mm. Every day, like my children needed another mother, not me, right? Yeah, I feel that pain. A really terrible place to be at that okay. time. I can go right back into it. And so that practice, these practices that I write about in the hormone fix, the art of gratitude, leaving the past behind and, and focusing, being in the present moment and just focusing on what our one next right step will be is, is that, that increasing oxytocin. So by that practice of gratitude that you adapted and, and that, you know, and that love for yourself, that spiritual connection that you were able to feel. And harnessing that, knowing that you are perfectly and wonderfully made, you are the mother they chose to have, and um, and this is what just focusing on what's the next right step, and how do we bring joy? How do we increase oxytocin in our lives? I love that doing it one step at a time because I think that um, I think that for so many people, 
you know, they almost, they can't, they, you don't have to see the whole staircase, do you? But I think for so many people, they can't almost take that step because they feel like they need to. And as you say, it's just like, I think Esther Hicks says, what's the next best feeling you can feel? Like, cause you can't kind of go from down here to all the way up there, but what's the next best thing? And then slowly, but surely it's almost like the compound effect, isn't it? You just kind of climb back up, but it's so hard. And I feel for people that struggle with this um, because we don't want people to hit rock bottom, right? Your experience so painful. Um, and my own experience was a, was a real challenge. Um, but I feel like the more we can spread this message and help people, the better so that they can um, kind of get out of it. And so oxy, obviously increasing oxytocin is one of the best ways in terms of redressing that balance. What else have you found? Because you've you, the, your nutritional approach is really interesting because it combines the alkalizing effect of greens with the keto um, diet, which is really interesting because I think hard keto can actually be really disruptive for people's hormones, can't it? I've seen that in some people and almost push them towards menopause. Whereas the way that you do it with the greens, can you just elaborate for people listening? Because it, it's such an intuitive and great way of doing it. Yes. And so, you know, that's what I say, like the, the getting keto green, it's a diet and a lifestyle. And it goes back to that second menopause at age 48. And I went strict keto because I was gaining this weight. And look, I'd been well over 240 pounds at one point, lost 80 pounds and kept it off for, you know, a long, long time. Right. And then that seemed like overnight gained that 20 pounds back. So I'm like, I'm going keto. I knew a lot about the keto my um, oldest daughter had seizures. And so in corp understanding how we really want to incorporate keto, especially to help with seizure disorder, that that was really powerful. And I used it in my clinical practice, modified for candida patients, you know, to, to eliminate candida or yeast infections from your body or chronic yeast infections, go really cut back all the carbs. And so go ideally keto. And so I was experiencing this myself and yet I was irritable. I would, I felt like I hit a wall I, and I had to understand what was going on. And so I did what I tell my patients to, and most functional medicine docs will say, you know, check your urine pH, look for alkalinity. Well, I checked with a urine test strip and I was as acidic as a pH paper read on urine and urine is a biomarker. That's why doctors check it. When you come into the office, we check a number of things, but one of the things we check is pH. We never talk about it at all because it's so variable, but it's there on the, on the test strips for a reason. And so, but it is a biomarker. It's a, it's a vital sign to our body. And so I was acidic as the pH paper read. And for me, that was an aha moment. I was like, of course, you know, of course I'm acidic. And I, you know, I attributed it to the keto diet at that time, even though I was eating healthy keto foods, right. I wasn't bacon and butter. I was, you know, bison and good beef and avocado and oils and good things like that. But it, it, you know, I was really, really acidic. And so that aha moment, so no wonder I feel irritable, you know, I'm on edge, my nervous system is fried, I'm robbing Peter to pay Paul, so to speak, to keep my body, you know, my blood pH in balance, again, chronic low malnourishment can create metabolic acidosis. So we want to avoid that our blood pH is really designed to stay so tightly, you know, tightly managed, and then we will sacrifice bone and muscle to make it tightly managed at, you know, around 7.4. So slightly alkaline. And so urine, so that was huge for me. So I was like, ah, oh, okay. So I started adding the microgreens and like beet greens and kale and um, Swiss chard and broccoli and, and cruciferous vegetables for hormonal detoxification and recognizing that a lot of the, the carnivorous food that I was eating has their own set of hormones, right? And probably stress hormones if they weren't killed in a humanely way, you know I mean? So anyway, it was, um, it was quite fascinating. And so I started incorporating more greens and I check in my urine pH regularly all throughout the day. And I recommend everyone do that, especially starting, um, any dietary changes to get a, 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 in touch with what's going on with your body. And, um, and so as I started doing that, I started to get more alkaline, but Angela, one thing I noticed, cause I was testing every day, every morning, every time I went to the bathroom, basically I'm doing this research. And, um, the mornings I would do my gratitude journaling, or I would walk on the beach, hence lowering cortisol and increasing oxytocin. 
I, my urine pH was more alkaline all day. Wow. Isn't that interesting? Mm-hmm. Because I found that when I tracked my blood sugar, if I practiced gratitude, my blood sugar would go down on the continuous blood glucose monitor. If I did meditation, if I'd had a bad night's sleep, it would go up fasting blood glucose. But then if I practiced those spiritual practices, it would go down. Isn't that interesting? Yes. That you're able to modify your body's pH with lifestyle factors. Absolutely. And I think that, and just thoughts, right? Just yeah. thoughts like that, that ability. So that combination became my keto green or keto alkaline way of doing things. And so that's where incorporating the microgreens, the green foods and intermittent fasting, because it took me a long time to get into ketosis. Why? When we're chronic, when we have PTSD, when we're in chronic stress, cortisol is increasing our blood glucose, like that continuous glucose monitor showed you when mm-hmm. you're stressed, when you're not getting enough sleep, you're going to have higher levels of blood sugar. That's going to be harder for us to get into ketosis. Men do it very quickly. They have 10 times more testosterone, more muscle mass. They get into ketosis quick. I mean, you know, and they miss a meal and they can be in ketosis. So initially it took me three days of really strict fasting and carb restricting to get into ketosis. And so since then I'm pretty, pretty quick about it. I can get into ketosis maybe at a 16 hour, 18 hour fast now, but not, not less. It takes that long and it's really important. And and sometimes I have to do a whole day fasting in order to kick my body back into ketosis. And, you know, my blood sugar is really well managed now, but I have family history of diabetes. So there's these little pearls are so fascinating. And that's why, you know, you know, figuring out what's, what's changing in your body is so important. Yeah, really important. And just to clarify for people, so they understand, because obviously there's some, it's interesting as well, because you being a medical doctor, actually opening up and saying, no, we test this, because I see them when you go to the doctor, one of the first thing they do is like dipstick your urine. Many doctors turn around and go, no, 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 that's rubbish. The body has its own acid alkaline system. But in reality, yes, it will keep the blood stable, but it will draw minerals from the bone, right, to do that. You are, as you say, robbing Peter to pay Paul. It exactly. doesn't, it can't, it can't do this without sacrificing something else. Well, no, um, it's got to come from somewhere, right? It's yeah. got to come from somewhere to balance that. And when we're not getting the minerals in, and it is important, you know, to add minerals too, if we haven't, especially if we're very acidic and haven't been alkaline, it, you know, this is what I tell my clients and tell my colleagues, my physician friends and, and people that I've taught now all over the world. It's that, you know, when we, we know the research on urine pH testing, there are numerous research studies that looked at urine pH testing. And what we know is that the more alkaline your urine pH is, if it's over seven, you have decreased diabetes, heart disease, decreased metabolic syndrome, decreased risk of cancer, osteoporosis, and other inflammatory diseases. And that's really critical information to know. And it's so easy. It costs pennies a day. And that is powerful information that every person out there can do and check and keep an eye on because sometimes you're eating like, you know, like a vegetarian gets cancer. What's going on? They're really alkaline really alkaline, but they're stressed, they're angry, they're upset, they're traumatized, they have, you know, whatever situation that creates that acidity. And I think that's why regardless of what your diet is, you can't assume that you're um, alkaline, and you can't assume that you're in ketosis, you really have to check. Mm, That's a really good point. And what about have you found so when you're checking, and you encourage people to do this across the day, that if they're very well hydrated, Does that skew things or is that just in any event, it's making you more alkaline and that's a good um, result anyway, right? It's where we want to get to. What have you found in terms of hydration levels and how it impacts it? Yeah, definitely. Dehydration creates more acidity. So yeah, hydration does help and hydration with the right stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So filtered water without chemicals, because many, you know, uh, faucet water has chlorine in it, which will make you more acidic, negative ion. And so it's, you know, understanding these things will make a difference. And have you found that like adding things like hydrogen water, for example, makes a difference? I know that's high in antioxidants, but does that help in terms of the alkalizing effect? I've used it, actually purchased an alkalinizer um, water filter at my home, in my Georgia home. And um, I found it to be incredibly beneficial, but we don't want to drink 
you know, alkaline water with our meals, right? Mm. Because that's going to decrease our stomach pH. I mean, it's basic chemistry. And this is what I tell clients where with our meals, we want to have, maybe that's for our glass of wine or a cup of coffee or whatever, but we really don't want to drink with our meals. We want to um, let the start to break down the food and our digestive enzymes in our stomach digest and break down all the, um, all the food so that we are able to absorb the maximum, you know, micro and macronutrients. But um, certainly as we get older, our stomach acid decreases. And when you just think like if you eat a piece of steak and our stomach is designed to pour acid onto it and dissolve that steak, right? Dissolve that food. But if we eat that piece of steak and we pour a, you know, a tall glass of water or the endless refills that we do here in America, then that dilutes the digestive enzymes and the food there will, you know, decompose. We get more gas. We don't digest it well enough. So fluid restriction during a meal is, is critical. And I tell clients to stop drinking 20 minutes before and up and wait till typically one to two hours after and add digestive enzymes to your meal and try to limit your, your intake during your meal to, you know, four to six ounces. Yeah. I've noticed that really reduces bloating. And actually at a weekend, if I have a glass of wine, as you say, my digestion seems improved. Um, yeah. just, just from pairing that together, <laughs> yeah, kind of going a bit a French, good, a good, a good reason for it, right? A good, a good reason. reason. For it. <laughs> um, so in terms of then as well, um, let's just talk about the kind of keto diet that you advocate here. Cause I know we were, we were chatting as well, and you feature this in the book that sometimes depending on your genetics, like if you have APOE4, this is when you need to become a little bit more careful in terms of saturated fat intake. Um, and also fasting becomes more important. Can you explain for the listeners a little bit about that and also integrate, you know, there's a lot out there at the moment that sometimes fasting in and of itself can push cortisol up and that maybe women shouldn't be fasting as long as men um, and just your approach in that regard. Well, again, remember cortisol is acidifying. So if we're creating a physiology that's alkalinizing, we can really fast a long time. I'm just off a 72 hour fast now and I feel great, right? Cre- you know, really important to just recognize how you're feeling, but look, fasting is a muscle and it, we can be very stressed about it, stressed about fasting. That's going to increase cortisol along with fasting itself. So that alkalinizing component becomes really important. Drinking alkaline water during your fast, you know, or, you know, starting your fast with a keto green smoothie or breaking your fast with a keto green smoothie. So you're alkalinizing your foods right away, uh, your, your system right away. Or I use my Mighty Maca Plus, even sometimes while I'm fasting or in the middle of a fast because it's very alkalinizing, won't break a fast and helps detoxify the body. So I think we have to think of things like that. And we do really, really well. We see a decrease in inflammatory markers and improvement in DHEA, which um, directly influences cortisol So and, and our reproductive hormones. So we see an improvement in our adrenal hormones when we go keto green. And that's, that is a huge difference. And with the APOE4, what I've seen, I've seen clients with APOE4 and oftentimes they'll get a surge in their, you know, maybe an elevation in cholesterol, and then it will come down around the three to six month mark from with consistently being keto green with the, um, and when I'm talking about keto for us, like if I talk about a keto green shake, I'll tell you what I just made. I used my keto green powder, which is a vegan, um, protein powder, some MCT oil, a little bit of uh, coconut cream, a quarter of an avocado and a scoop or two of Mighty Maca in there, ice and ice and water. And that was my keto green smoothie. And another keto green meal you can have, think about like a, um, a palm of, you know, chicken, grilled chicken on with a bed of greens drizzled with olive oil and adding some nuts, mineral salt, pepper, spices, spice up, and then a good handful of sprouts or sauerkraut, something to add to assist with digestion as well. Or you can add some apple cider vinegar into your salad dressing. And so things to assist digestion. So that's like a keto green, a good keto green lunch. And there's so many ways like that's a really healthy, you know, a healthy visual for um, getting keto green and that eating that way and watching and monitoring, especially when you have risk factors like APOE4 is, 
is definitely beneficial and watching that cortisol, right? Because I think that's where we see the problem is when we're eating that high fat and being very acidic, when we balance the alkalinity factor, that's game changing. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. Interesting. And so have you in terms of when you're measuring that alkalinity in the urine, have you found though that you will naturally be more acidic after the overnight? Um, so your first morning void, is that naturally more acidic where you've been holding it? Can you expect that? What, what should oh. people's expectations be at that time of day? Yeah, but I really like people to wake up alkaline. And that typically will okay. indicate that they got a good night's sleep. They were, you know, they had de-stressed. They, they had, you know, sometimes we have to improve like adding magnesium before bedtime, you know, adding sometimes adaptogens before bedtime to really help get that, those minerals up and the, um, that's deep restorative sleep. That makes a huge difference when you wake up alkaline and you can do that. Absolutely. And even when you're in, you know, fasting, because you typically are fasting while you're sleeping. And so at least, you know, we really try to fast 13 to 16 hours on a regular basis overnight. But even with with extended fast, it's, you know, when you're in high ketosis, you're typically acidic, it's hard to be in high ketosis and alkaline at the same time. But adding the alkalinizers in like the mighty maca plus and the mineral salts really help and especially magnesium. Um, can really help with that alkalinity factor. And you do, you feel better, you feel grounded, you feel more rested, you feel more at home in your body. And that makes a big, that really does make a big difference. A huge and difference. Check, mm -hmm. You know, after workouts, you'll be, you'll naturally be acidic. That's great. Yeah. It's okay. But it's important to understand what's happening. And is there a period that you would expect that acidity to last a post-workout? Uh, it's really it? depends. It really does depend. So like I've been doing these great infrared yoga, hot yoga classes here in Dallas at this place called Ritual One. They have infrared plates. And so you're oh, like nice. broiling in there basically, but it's so it's infrared is so good for you. And, and just the, the workouts are pretty intense. And so like, I'll go into it alkaline and I'll come out very acidic. And typically like I, I just, I just quickly do tall glass. I'm drinking a lot of water. It's my, you know, it's more of a, um, it's filtered water or pH balanced water. And then adding in the mighty mock of the alkalinizers right away. And by my next void, it's, it's better. It's better. It's not completely alkaline yet. So I would say, you know, a, probably somewhere between three to six hours, but you okay. have, you're, you know, being, um, uh, intentional about, the alkal, you know, alkalinizing again afterwards. So I think that makes a big difference in how your body heals and recovers faster. Yeah, which is obviously key, the recovery, but also it's important, isn't it, to have that sort of form of hormesis and, and actually exercise and put your body through those paces. Tell me what's in the Mighty Maca, because Maca is really helpful as well, isn't it, for balancing DHEA and cortisol? What, what's in that um, that you add? That's something, yeah. that's your own supplement, right? Yes. Yeah. It's from my journey around the world. Cause when I was in Peru, I learned about maca and, you know, I learned about these healing foods and they said, well, if you're infertile, drink maca. If you're, you know, if you're tired, drink maca. If your child's not thriving, give it maca. And then they elbowed my husband. So it's a Peruvian Viagra. And I'm like, oh, we're going to drink some maca here. You know what I mean? <laughs> and as a researcher, I needed to understand what it was. Well, maca is one of those indigenous uh, roots to Peru. It's kind of like a tuber, like a, a turnip or, um, uh, you know, a large, you know, large radish or beet. And it, there are different um, strains of maca. The ones in Peru grow at the highest altitude and those are the richest in nutrients. And I use organic kosher maca from Peru for the same source now since 20, uh, 2009, 2008, when I created my formula. And the, where you get the maca from is different. Um, it really, it will have different effects. So Peruvian maca is the gold standard and it is full of, it's adaptogenic. We know it helps the adrenals, whether you're in overdrive or underdrive. It helps with, um, it's rich in, in arginine. It's, a, it's considered one of the cruciferous in the cruciferous family. So it helps with estrogen detoxification. It has glucosinates in it. It's also very high in arginine, which increases, which increases nitric oxide. Mm. 
Mm. And that increases blood flow. And that's how Viagra works, you yeah. know, to increase nitric oxide. And so it was very interesting. And then to help with libido, I really believe it's a genetic adaptogen. Like we know resveratrol and turmeric are and quercetin. And so I incorporated those ingredients, resveratrol, turmeric, quercetin, green tea extract, grapeseed extract, blueberry, mangosteen, acerola, these amazing power fruits, and then extracts that I experienced around the world. And I incorporated that into the formula. Number one, because I couldn't stand the taste of maca on itself. I just couldn't, I was revulsed by it, but I'm like, I'm drinking it. And, but I started adding other superfoods to it. I said, Hmm, let me see what other medicinal foods are here. And in Peru, there was cat's claw. And I put that in there and that's a potent anti-inflammatory and many research showing that it's a anti-carcinogenic. So I put cat's claw herb in there and then some greens and enzymes to improve digestion and just use science and, and practice for a few years as I formulated that product. And we used it in my clinical practice, just initially ordered enough 500 canisters to make a batch and, um, used it for myself, my family, friends, and my patients. And it just started growing word of mouth. We saw improvements in blood pressure, elimination of hot flashes. It's safe for my celiac patients and my breast cancer patients and helped with blood pressure. I mean, we just saw a hormone balance was a really big Mm. finding. And again, I really contributed this concoction to helping me reestablish my menstrual cycle and my fertility as well. And we've got many mighty maca babies to prove it too. So, which is nice. Amazing. How exciting. That's even better, isn't it? It I want is. to try this um, Mighty Maca. I'm, tr- I'm, I'm excited to give it a go. Um, one of the things, I want to come back to sexual health there because that obviously is an issue for women. But before we go there, um, one thing that I know so many people struggle with in perimenopause is like so much bleeding. It's the time when, and their ferritin levels drop, they get exacerbated brain fog. It's no longer just the hormones. Now they've got really low iron. Um, and also they're struggling, right? It's something to really cope with, isn't it? I know from my... PCOS and endometriosis, that that is a struggle. Um, what What's going on there and how can they reduce this bleeding and just ha- have a better transition, right? Menopause should be a beautiful time in a woman's life. And I think, I think actually I heard you talking on another podcast, um, you were mentioning that the Japanese word, I forget what it is, that it actually means second spring. And I just love that. That was such a good I way. I love that. Yeah. Because yeah, it is, right? Konenki. Yeah. Konenki. Second, second spring. And so I say we should breeze through menopause into our second spring. We shouldn't have oh. to suffer. And let me just tell you the impact of, of these changes and, and like following the protocol and guidelines in my book, the hormone fix, it's not just a dietary. It's not just about getting keto green, eating keto green. It's about living it. Like we talked about gratitude, you know, intermittent fasting, no more snacking, getting a good night's sleep, all of the removing toxins from our body. I mean, all of this play into the keto green lifestyle. And it's essential for menopause because as we get older, our brain has a harder time using glucose for fuel, which is its primary fuel source, but key and, and utilization of glucose for fuel is an estrogen dependent issue. So that's why we get this brain fog and stuff that's going on. And this more estrogen kind of um, disturbances in the perimenopause, we see a lot of estrogen dominance. We see highs and lows in these swings, and that creates havoc to our endometrium, the inside lining of the uterus. And so we see the heavier than normal periods and just breakthrough bleeding and, and predominantly because we don't have enough progesterone. The hormone, you know, our mother hormone, the hormone that we produce predominantly in our luteal phase of our menstrual cycle, and it becomes insufficient. And so we really have to improve progesterone and we can do it with things like Mighty Maca Plus with adding progesterone with decreasing cortisol because cortisol robs our progesterone. So you add in just stress of worry and, you know, worrying about aging, worrying about our kids, worrying about whatever we're worrying about because we're good at worrying when we're moms, we've got to learn not to worry. So true. It's so, so true. And so, you know, and, and that can really help with the menstrual, with the menstrual flow. And so in my medical practice as a gynecologist, as I healed my body and I started to incorporate these things, I went from doing two to three surgeries per week to two to three major surgeries per year. Wow. That's how our body has the ability to heal itself. That's amazing. And using, yeah 
using natural products, using natural, understanding our circadian rhythm and, you know, and balancing our hormones naturally. I mean, we don't need to, for the most part, sometimes we do. I, I didn't say I eliminated surgeries altogether. I reduced them significantly to two to three major surgeries per year. And that's huge. Sometimes we have to still remove the uterus or, you know, do, uh, you know, remove an ovary or whatever the situation may be, but it's quite, quite reduced. And that's powerful. That is so powerful. Mm -hmm. And also that is the time, isn't it? For, for people that are listening and are a bit nervous about increasing fats in their diet, this really impacts the production of sex hormones. This isn't like perimenopause is not the time to go low fat. No, definitely no. not. <laughs> and also no. for your skin health as well. I think people underestimate the impact that it has in terms of looking younger as well. Absolutely. And vaginal health. I mean, fat is yeah. part of every cell membrane and our mucous membranes are so susceptible. As we age, the vaginal health starts to decline as well. I mean, dryness. I always say you worry about your lip, you know, lip lines or wrinkles around your eyes. You got to worry about the lines down there even more because that affects your quality of life faster than anything. When I was struggling, I couldn't do horseback riding. I wet myself when I exercised and all of those things that were just like, you know, forget about how enjoying sex. Like, let me just check that one off the list. So, mm -hmm. so all of these vaginal changes happen and really a keto green diet is hugely beneficial to healthy fats and our healthy keto choices as well as the plant diversity that helps with the diversity of the microbiome that helps support a healthy vaginal pH. So that combination is really important for, for sexual health. Yeah, so important. Because I know so many people that they, they really struggle in perimenopause, you know, that they're like, oh my God, I've just completely gone off sex. And that's difficult as well, difficult for their relationship, for their husband, everything. Um, because then you're not getting enough oxytocin, right? Sex yeah. increases oxytocin and then you feel more. I mean, that puts us back together, puts us on the same page, 100%. right? Connected mm. again. That is, you know, that is a anecdote to disconnect. And, and we can't, and we shouldn't power. Most so many of my patients would say, I'm just powering through. And that's why I created, you know, some of my other products to help with these, you know, what we're suffering with, and we don't have to, we can improve vaginal health at any age, like we can help with erectile dysfunction. And when guys are experiencing erectile dysfunction, and women are having vaginal dryness, it's huge disconnect. Mm. And, that and as you say, that, that disconnect, like marriages fail as a result of that, because as soon as that intimacy goes, that was really the only difference between a normal friendship and a marriage. It's that fundamental, isn't it? So right. um, tell us about the Jolva cream and, and how that works. I know that's one of your products. Yeah. And I want to say like a lot of times too, just with that disconnect, like that vaginal dryness issue that causes, if we have pain and discomfort every time we have do something, why would we want to do it? Mm. Right. And because we're also comfortable and safe with our partner that we can have naturally less lubrication. So we have to keep, especially as we're getting older, we have to keep that vaginal tissue. When we do switch partners, you may notice an increase in lubrication temporarily because it's, you know, a foreign, a foreign, you know, there's the whole nother excitement level. There's a, a new partner, there's another level of excitement and that natural response from our body is to excrete fluid, right? To, to have more vaginal moisture during that time. Cause I would hear that from so many patients and they would say, well, you know, once I, you know, got my, a new partner, I had great vaginal lubrication and then it's di died off again. And that's, uh, that's normal. It's not about your relationship. It's about your physiology. So I created Jolva to help keep the vaginal tissue and vulvar tissue healthy. And I created it as a cosmetic cream. So you don't have to insert anything into the vagina if you don't want to, but applying it clitoris to anus, because the clitoris atrophies, it's like, just like you wouldn't want a penis to shrink. You don't want your clitoris to shrink. Right. And so a clitoral atrophy is a really big problem. And plus the dryness of the lips and the dryness and narrow of the vagina. So we want to keep that tissue healthy. And with Jolva, because of my science and, and what I was doing with reproduct with bioidentical hormones using testosterone and DHEA before, like, for example, before incontinence surgery or vaginal prolapse surgery, I would use, you know, androgenic hormones because it gave me better tissue to suture. But as I got better and better at it, Angela, I, my patients would come back in for their pre-op because I'd prepare them 
you know, two months in advance with these vaginal formulas or topical creams, and they'd come in for their pre-op the day or two before surgery. And like, Dr. Ann, I'm not leaking anymore. I'm not having these issues anymore. And I'm like, oh, then I don't have to do surgery. So hence, you know, it was not good for business, but it was a <laughs> you good, created a whole good new outcome. business. So yeah, good outcome for everyone. So, yeah. Um, so that's why I created Jolva. So it has DHEA, it has plant stem cells from the Alpine Rose, which is really this magical flower that grows in the Swiss Alps. And it's been, it's um, stem cells have been shown to help with wrinkles and collagen production and be antiviral. It's just one of these great, great um, stem so, cells. So by putting it on down there, is it going to help create anti-aging effects across the body? Because obviously the skin is a great um, entry route, right? For absorbing things. Um, it is. It is. And, okay. Yeah, and the vulva and the vaginal area is so vascular has so much capacity. Mm, so so much blood flow going there. there. Mm -hmm. yeah, and everyone mm -hmm. doesn't matter how, how overweight you are or anything, you you're going to have good access with the vaginal. And and the clitoris shrinking that you're talking about there, that happens. What is that in response to hormones? Cause presumably this is then really affecting women's ability to orgasm. And let's face it. If you can never orgasm, you're probably not going to be that inclined to get a bit of nookie on, are you in the first place? <laughs> no, <laughs> so. no. So staying really in tune, exactly. And so we've had, you know, as a gynecologist, I've seen extremely severely atrophic clitorises and vaginas and like where you can't even examine a patient because it's so stenotic. It's so hardened and dried. And it's like, no one should suffer that way. No one should suffer that way. And, um, and we can restore it through these, and you know, these, you know, these androgenic hormones, such as testosterone or DHEA. And that as a, like I say, an ounce of prevention really, really, um, is a pound of cure in this instance, because we want it's to amazing. prevent. And is that a cream that you would put on without testing that's suitable for anyone that's in their forties, basically, or fifties? It really is. And especially like if you're not breastfeeding postpartum to help with the tightening of the vaginal muscles and everything again with Kegel exercise, I would say with Kegel exercise, Jolva works great for strengthening the pelvic floor. So, um, you know, that is an, a powerful combination. And yeah, I think that pretty much, you know, I'm recommending it pretty universally for those of us over 40, certainly over 50 and postmenopausal. And is it something in that your 80s using it? Oh, do you? <laughs> it's always good to hear about people in their 80s. I love um, it. Love it. Like I'm taking it? care of this. This is important. Yeah, that's yeah. amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and is it something that you would put on like on a daily basis? Should it yeah. be done? Like, is it stimulatory? Could you put it on before doing Kegel exercises? Like, what's the best way of using Jolva? Yeah. So it's really, it's really a safe formula. And so a small amount, I made it very concentrated because who likes to use a lot of stuff, a lot of cream. And so, um, a small amount goes a long way. So about a pea size formula, apply it daily clitoris to anus. You can put it on a, a toilet paper and wipe with it. If you're, you know, just kind of get it into your routine or use it. Also, you can use it again during sex or with intercourse, it can go right on the penis as well. And so, um, another very safe for guys and, um, you know, powerful for them too. So amazing. Mm -hmm. I'm going to link to all of this in the, in the show notes. Um, and before you go, tell me, cause I know you're a bit tight on time, but you, your skin is glowing. It looks amazing. You have a beautiful complexion. Uh, what do you think is responsible for that? Have you got any tricks? And in addition to the keto green diet, any tricks up your sleeve there? Well, I will tell you a, another secret. Okay. So definitely being keto green. I mean, I definitely look long, younger than I did six, seven years ago. So this has uh, made a difference and I had I'd sh share in pictures sometimes in my webinars where I had such hair loss and my skin elasticity was terrible at drooping chin, all this stuff. So no Botox, no fillers, none of that. And, um, but I do use Jolva on my lips and I'm creating a a lip formula for Jolva Ooh. because I'm working down there and I started using it here when my Christian Dior red lipstick started, you know, see, bleeding. I started to get those bleeding lines. I was yeah. terrible. I was like, oh, can't do this. Like it's our signature red right now. And, um, and so I started using Jolva on my lips and then created an emollient formula that comes out this year. And so Jolva on the lips, you can use Jolva 
lower lips, upper lips. That's really powerful. And then my progesterone cream, which has progesterone, pregnenolone and tripeptides. I use it. I use it on my face. Not every, not every night, but about, you know, four to five nights a week. I Can use, you use that around the eye area. Yes. To help with these wrinkles. That's the biggest thing I notice. I'm like, mm, I need to look after my eyes. Yeah. I have them, but they're going to be smile lines. I'm determined they're going to be smile lines. Yeah. Oh, amazing. You. So again, that, that cream, the progesterone, pregnenolone, you can use that without any kind of hormone testing. This stuff's good for anyone, is it? And who's kind of over the age of 40, if you like. Yeah, definitely over the age of 40, 45. I mean, if you're still having regular cycles, no PMS symptoms, no perimenopause symptoms, no, you know, anxiety or regular cycles, then probably let's just use Mighty Maca Plus and just, you know, support the adrenals through the transition until you start, you know, having the evidence of estrogen dominance or progesterone deficiency. And then I would add on progesterone to help with the cycle. And there's sometimes in clients younger that I'll, I'll use it in, but you know, I'm watching them pretty close. It is very, very safe. And I don't want to disturb anyone's own natural progesterone production, but over age 35, our progesterone level, by the time we hit 45, it's already down a good 30 to 40%. And then by the time we're 50, it's down 60, 70% from our, our peak hormone level. So we need progesterone is a very good anti-aging hormone. It's a neuroprotective hormone. It helps with our brain. It helps with sleep. It helps with anxiety. It helps with memory. And these are important. It really, again, if we were living out in the Amazon, living in nature, swimming in a stream, drinking from nature, eating from nature, fresh foods, and there's a lot of life in that, a lot of alkalinizing life in that. But with our lives indoors, I find that most of us, most of us benefit tremendously from progesterone and pregnenolone, these mother hormones, and so much better than we do, we would anything, you know, any other prescription medication, bioidentical progesterone, I would have used it for you in postpartum depression. I used it in my mm. patients in postpartum depression as a very natural antidepressant and to help with the deep sleep and to support your hormones. I mean, three babies definitely by, you know, one baby depletes our fatty acids and, you know, and by our third baby, all reproductive hormones and omega-3 fatty acids are are really struck, like are really at a low in everyone that I tested with functional testing. And so adding progesterone during that time, it was game changing for so many of my patients with postpartum depression. And wow. the same with memory loss in the menopause, women who have had their ovaries removed are often so told you don't need progesterone because you don't have a uterus. We only use progesterone to prevent you from getting uh, endometrial cancer from unopposed estrogen. I mean, that's the reason they do estrogen only if you've had a hysterectomy. That makes no sense. There are progesterone receptors all over our body and in our fascia. That's why women who have had their ovaries removed often say, I have joint pain. I'm having memory fog. Well, what happened when I started prescribing progesterone for these women, they would say, Dr. Anna, I feel like a fog has lifted. I feel like a fog has lifted. So the combination of progesterone and sleeping better and this beautiful hormone balance, because they needed progesterone, like as I've proven, when you do progesterone before you get the hysterectomy to help with that bleeding, you often don't need the hysterectomy for most cases, not all. But that progesterone, whether you have a uterus or not, is very be beneficial, especially over age 45, for sure. I see that. And we use it cyclically. And my formula I created to be very clean with some you know, essential oils and some anti-aging tripeptide, which is good for the skin, and with pregnenolone as well, which is good for and so many good reasons to take pregnenolone, good for memory. And I like transdermal absorption, so we're not having to... Um, metabolize it through the liver or first plat first pass through the liver. So transdermally mm. we bypass that and we can use the smaller dose. More and also you're not having to use things like suppositories, which for, so for many women, it's just like, I, I can't do that. <laughs> do well, that's that. why I hated so. doing anything vaginally for mm. myself. And I said, if I'm not going to do it for myself, so creating topical creams really makes a difference. That's amazing. This has been so much fun. I know that everyone is going to absolutely love listening to this. And any of the men that are listening, they just need to tell their wives if they haven't listened already to tune into this. Um, it's been absolutely incredible to have you on the show, Dr. Anna. Where can people find you? Please link and say, where are you? what platform are you most active? How can they connect with you? 
Thank you. Thank you. So definitely my website at dranna.com. So D-R-A-N-N-A.com. Really easy to find me. I'm on Instagram at the girlfriend doctor and on Facebook. I have a great keto green community of active keto greeners, over 12,000 of us in that keto green community on Facebook. Amazing. I will link to all of that in the show notes. Thank you so, so much for coming on the show. Thank you. My honor. Thanks for having me.